Mr. Amos? Here. Mr. Morrissey? Mrs. Klein? Here. Mr. Boyd? Here. Mr. Schreiner? Here. And Mrs. Jones? Here. Motion to approve the agenda. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> All right. So um, uh, first up, we um, kind of restructured our council meetings a little bit different. As people know, we've gone to uh, two meetings a month uh, with our planning session for council. Uh, but we wanted to do departmental updates overall. Uh, and this first part is uh, Chief Fitzgerald giving a departmental update. Uh, after that, we had a um, um, work session by Mrs. Klein with regards to a discussion of criminal activity. And then after that, we have an update on Waterloo fire operation. I think we wanted to say that it's important that we don't wait to the end of the year uh, until budget till we hear about what's taking place with our department. So uh, you are first up on here. So uh, take it away, Chief. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Joel Fitzgerald, Chief of Police. I'm here to give you a sort of mid-year report on the department. All right, this year's summer summarizing our staff meeting uh, as we're all still in quarantine. Um, there's been a lot of questions about the quarantine. I'm sure you know that we're still in quarantine. But um, to make it clear, we are authorized to do things like raise people from seats and do things. Um, 118 officers are currently retired. And we're hiring these down to five or six uh, candidates. That gives you an idea of how hard our guys are working uh, compared to cities like size and you know what other departments look at as far as staffing and things like that. And we are going to uh, you'll see that we are going to do updates that will be helpful to them in updating their business as usual. And uh, part of this part of this is she planned out. Uh, we have some noteworthy 
Shootings versus shots fired. Let me clarify. A shooting is when someone is hit in most cities. Uh, we count shootings as when you have a gunshot call and a fine is shown in the city. And a gunshot call is felony. So we make that a shooting call. Um, a shots fired call would be, I'm sorry, I should have corrected it. A shooting call would also be a call where someone is actually struck. So when someone struck, an actual shooting occurred. A uh, shots fired call would be a call where we were able to confirm whether or not uh, there was a shooting involved. So therefore, shots fired calls and shooting calls are slight. Uh, we see the uh, shooting calls as being closer to within five minutes of the shooting. Uh, so again, trending-wise, we're right there of where we were last year. We can never be satisfied with where we are. We can always be better. But uh, that is that is the fact. So that is where we are right now versus uh, last year. Our year-to-date major cases. Uh, these are cases where our detectives are handling uh, cases that have follow-up and require uh, intensive investigatory training for uh, homicides. And the entire 2020, the COVID year, we had eight homicides. Year-to-date, as of May, we had three. Sexual assault uh, year to date. And I'll just remind you the 2020 status for the entire year of 2020 in this slide, and the year to date stats for 2021 is where the dates you see that our year to date stats are uh, roughly in line with half of what we had in uh, 2021, in some cases less than half. Uh, again, in the robbery area and in the child pornography area. So I think our bar barometer. Many of you don't know we have uh, we prove very often uh, with some overtime on our C streets programs, and um, this is an example of what we're excited to do. Uh, we have one officer assigned to the ATF task force. Uh, we handle gun related crimes along with our guys that are going out to get uh, individual sales. So our ATF person, uh, Waterloo police officer assigned to ATF, who specifically works on cases here in the city for illegal gun sales, whether they're gun, gun store or whether they're sales of gun or straw purchases, just someone uh, going in to purchase firearms from someone else. So someone normally not legally able to possess a firearm gets another person to purchase it for them. Um, we've had tremendous, tremendous success in taking guns off the street. Uh, the stats you heard lately is over 500 semi guns and over 500 Due to our partnerships with the FBI and the ATF Partners Task Force. Um, you'll see we have two officers assigned to the FBI Task Force, and one works in the Tri-County Task Force, and the other works in Violent Crime. And those officers, along with the officer at the uh, ATF, they can adopt cases um, that perhaps at the state level wouldn't receive um, many years of sentence. Uh, so we have more of a bite arm to uh, go out and deter people from committing any crimes that 
they know or they suspect may be handled federally. So our benefit from having officers on the air is to confirm that they very often get um, overtime and suspended uh, if the feds reimburse them. But it's this partnership to ensure that offenders, high level offenders, are being pursued and taken into public custody. In 2021, um, I worked with the DL Outfit Police Marshals Task Force to have our BCAD unit. Just reassigned to our detective unit to work as um, they're basically U.S. Marshals as well. They are sworn in as U.S. Marshals. They can travel outside of uh, outside of this jurisdiction, outside of the state, uh, to pursue criminals as long as the charges are being presented from Iowa here in this uh, region. So, in addition to having a BCAT unit adept at pulling firearms off the street and making a lot of arrests without taking investigation that the BCAT unit is now able to stretch their investigatory powers to uh, pursue the criminals that flee out of state. Uh, this has been a real boon to us because our detectives and investigators uh, frequently travel to uh, handle assignments outside of the state. And uh, just having the added teeth of knowing that when you get caught with a gun or you get caught with drugs or meth drugs or whatever in the city of Waterloo, and you are a known offender, you are looking at serious federal time from many different angles. So here we have the FBI agent that we have now with the U.S. Marshals unit. Um, again, this is Waterloo specific focus in deterring and arresting people involved in violent crime. Uh, many of you also know that we instituted a crisis intervention unit uh, staffed with three people from Elevate. The Elevate folks work with us uh, basically seven days a week, they any days off in between, obviously, but uh, they're on call with a police officer who is assigned to them for their tour of duty to work their shift. That police officer, when an obvious or a case that we suspect is mental health related, uh, is assigned to us to go out with the elevate person to handle that uh, particular offense. Many times in the, in the past, we've sent two people that are two police officers out to those scenes to handle an offense where a child with mental health issues, let's say, uh, refused to go to school or someone with mental health issues refused to um, take their medication. We now have a proactive lean of reduce some of the call load and follow-ups to ensure that um, we are addressing those with the mental health issues and mental illness problems proactively in the city of only city in the entirety of our jurisdiction here in Blackhawk County that does this. We're one of the few cities in the state that has dedicated those type of resources to the CIT. Um, you'll see it has no additional funding required. Uh, that's a big, a huge uh, deal for us because we're not hiring any additional civilian staff to come in. We were able to broker and leverage our relationship with um, Elevate to make this happen. So our city is uh, really set up nicely to proactively handle uh, some of the responses that have ended in suicide by police and others by looking at this through a different lens, and that is one of understanding, that is one of ensuring that our, all, all of our uh, police officers have engaged in CIT training, and that we have specialists that have had 40 hours training and their goal is getting everyone. I'm sure you'll have some questions. I tried to keep it brief pursuant to the new rules. And I don't want Kelly to kill me. Uh, so would you like to reserve questions for our criminal justice component? Thank you. Good presentation, good staff, I appreciate it. Um, and I love the crisis intervention program. Innovative, thank you for doing that. But I did have a citizen call me on this, saying they thought that this was funded through a grant to Elevate, and that at some point that money might run out. Do you know who, and what would you do then? Well, That's my first question, and I have one more follow-up to the FBI program. Uh, definitely, I mean, it is funded through a grant through Elevate. We, were, we worked with uh, uh, Mr. Lincoln over at Elevate to um, actually support that grant application. And I don't worry as much about the uh, grant 
expiring or them not being able to re-up the grant, what I would tell you is my uh, hope is that others would join into this grant and collaboratively attack, attack mental health as it relates to us as being first responders to mental, many mental health issues in the city. Um, you know, we're only one of the very few in, in Iowa, Joe, what would you say two total other cities in Iowa maybe have a mental health unit, three? Uh, so again, the grant funds for this type of program per se in this state are not being expended for this purpose. So we're pretty unique and uh, I'm, I feel like with the, well, we're also capturing now um, the number of times we use this program to help bolster our grant funding in the future. I think what you'll see is that we have many, many more responses that are mental health related than uh, we've ever captured. And now you'll see it at the end of the year. And I, I think it'll provide good support for, you know, Elevate and any other of the partners around in the uh, Blackhawk County that wish to participate as well to do so. This might just be my misunderstanding on how to read these stats, but early on in the year, the third slide, you had the LCMA back in study. Yes, ma'am. If I was reading it right, the means is the average for city our size. That's the first column. The fourth column is us. I I was shocked by the difference. Like the index of final eight. The mean was over 3,000, the ours was only 255, and then the last one, the CFS rate was over 1,000, and ours was only 135. Why that huge disparity? Is that we did it that much better? <laughs> I, I do think that we're, and that laugh wasn't to say no. <laughs> I, the laugh is to say that I, I think that we believe we're in a lot worse position than we are. Uh, I'm not saying that we don't need staff. I'm not saying, I, I think that, you know, over the last five years, you'll, you'll see that uh, Major Leibold and uh, the rest of the command staff have done a really good job of mitigating some of the problems that hit those other cities uh, in that mean as well. Uh, that's, I put that sad in there and, and left those because those were very telling. Um, you know, 67,000 on average, you know, population that aligned perfectly almost with our city. And um, it just gives you some perspective on what crime looks like or responses look like in other cities and the volume that they deal with. Uh, can we get better at when we are on a location solving the problem and moving on? Yes, we can. Do we need to develop and devote more time to community policing? Uh, that's why we have the MPO program, and yes, that'll eat in with some of our call time and everything else. Um, you'll see in that staffing study that comes uh, how much, because I, I, I department should at least be spending about 40% of the time actively pursuing community policing, 60% on calls. Well, I love that you have that as a target for your uh, grant as well. Thank you. Um, I, I just think, again, you know, when you're putting all this into perspective and you're looking at ICMA and you're looking at how city managers are, are looking at police departments and questioning how much you need, this is sort of, and I put their rule of thumb for them, and that's a good, I, I have other, yeah, yeah. other formulas that show higher numbers, other that show a slightly lower, but for the most part, yeah, I mean, 182 officers in the normal department in that range, right, as opposed to us having 123. So our guys are doing more with less, and you should be very proud of that. There's a, uh, uh, well, there's one room that we use for interrogation. <laughs> so uh, again, they don't have a real home. However, if you're not using that, they're able to be inside the station and utilize that area to write the reports. My hope is, and, uh, and this is what we drive home with our folks, is that they are to be on the street as often as they can for as long as they can. Um, they're yeah. obviously gonna be on some calls that don't necessitate an elevate response, but the, the aim is having them on the street and not having an officer have to run back to headquarters to retrieve an elevate person. They're not answering, I just said, by the way. No, they're not. So how do we but maintain we that integrity when they're in the station? 
we've, we've provided, that's why they have that, that area that I'm talking about where they are, should be in when nothing else is going on. Uh, if they're in the car, uh, the people that are operating those vehicles know that pursuant to CGIS, we have to make sure that they are not receiving any returns on the uh, police computer. So we have considered all of that and we understand that along with making sure that we get them fingerprinted and things like that, that those are the ways in which we can, you know, maintain our integrity as far as CGIS is concerned. So thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sir, ma'am. Excuse me, Chief. Um, first, I want to commend you, your whole department, for all that you all do. It's a very important job, um, and I know I stand with uh, my six other colleagues and all of us in applauding the hard work that your men and women, women in uniform do every day. I have two questions. So the first one is we have a couple of liaisons. I know an LGBTQ liaison with the police department and a downtown liaison, and I'm, I'm blanking on the third one. I believe we have three. Could you talk a little bit more about how those programs are working and how they're interacting with um, the population, the specific populations they're supposed to work with, and then I have a second question. Well, the LGBTQ uh, liaison or QIA plus liaison has uh, gotten a good response. I've gotten uh, emails saying that they have met our liaison and that they have, and I say they, the people that have been responding to me about the proactive nature that our liaison has taken to introduce herself to people and to ensure that, um, you know, the community out there that are, goes underserved, like other communities, know that we have dedicated an arm to them. Uh, the same way with homelessness liaison, that's the third that you were thinking of. Thank you. And uh, in particular, our downtown liaisons who we've had the call to step up a bit with the, uh, you know, recent shooting that we had downtown. And in addition to that, um, our dedication to our three ocean cars, which were our downtown liaisons, we have a, um, Another program we're running right now, and it's an overtime-based program, but we're going to be talking to the downtown business owners to see if we can keep it going uh, with their help financially. And that's on Mon I'm sorry, on Friday and Saturday nights, running 11 to 3 for the bars let out and uh, for us to be highly visible in the downtown area. So we've got a, a lot going on with, a, you know, not, I can tell you, I, I, you know, could we stand to have more people to join these things? Of course, but we have to wear a lot of different hats. And our, our guys and gals have really been going out there trying to make themselves available to members of the community and they've been seen. And as uh, COVID has relented a little bit, we're, we're gonna have more of an opportunity to go out and just actively or proactively, I should say, interact with, with people. And it's gonna be huge. Our, uh, I'll, I'll give you one event. We're, gonna, we're primed to, uh, to deal with the Juneteenth event. And when I say, do that, we're going to be um, potentially um, helping them grill and give out food that we had do do donated by way of Tyson Foods. So um, this department has really stepped up uh, in making sure that we not only have a relationship with the business owners, but also have a relationship with people who we normally uh, or in the past didn't overtly uh, try to engage with. Thank you. And I don't want to your thunder, but I know you rolled out the new program where specific officers are assigned to specific neighborhoods and areas. Um, can you just give us an, a, a little bit of an update on that? If it's coming out with your static report later, that's perfectly fine. Just wanted to see how that's also going. Uh, it, it's going well, and I'm getting good feedback. I mean, uh, someone sent, I think Mr. Amos just sent a, uh, a message to me about a, a group that did not know who their liaison was. Well, you aim not to have that happen. But with the groups not meeting as frequently anymore, it's been very hard for some of those guys to, and gals to go out and meet the folks in the community that are running these uh, meetings. Um, and this has been the only jurisdiction that it has taken so long in just because of COVID. But without question, every area in the city has you know, at least three MPOs that are going to be assigned to their particular area. So you know, whether one can make it to a meeting or another can make it to a meeting, uh, we, we're just, we intend to make sure, as Mr. Amos found out when I, when I emailed him immediately back, look, you tell me where those meetings are, I will make sure that the person that is in that particular area shows up with a lieutenant to explain the program and to also show that we're going to be consistent and uh, be there. Whether there's 10 people there or 100, we're going to go to those meetings and find out what's going on or what we can do to improve things in the community. What meetings, what meetings are you talking about? 
the neighborhood okay. meetings? Neighborhood association yeah. meetings that are already, many neighborhoods don't have an active association group. But a lot of them do. Yes. Yeah. And we're hoping that the ones that do, our people can make those meetings now. We want that. But we also want to be sensitive to those areas that don't have meetings and use the officer as the means by which we gather community members, uh, even if it's just to talk about certain criminal information that's going on in their community. If we have to be the attraction, we'll be the attraction. But we want to be actively um, engaged in what our community is going through and, and how we can even bridge city services uh, with members of the community. Uh, we'll go to Mr. Klein and then we'll transition <coughs> to Mike Ford. Okay. Something you said triggered a memory of a phone call that I got. You said that the elevate people do their um, paperwork in the building, in the room. They don't do it in the car. I'm not, I didn't say they didn't do it in the car. They oh. may do some in the car. I haven't ridden with any of them, but they do have the ability to go in a room and do their paperwork. Um, someone called me a while back and said that the officers themselves are not being allowed to write, do their paperwork and everything in the building anymore, that they're required to do them in the cars, and I thought I would just see what you say about that. Well, what I say is that our officers need to be on the street. We have prepared and given the officers the means by which they can do more of their work inside of the police vehicle, and I want them out on the street doing more of their work in the police vehicle. So they have not been restricted from coming in if someone tells you that you were misinformed. However, they have been told that they need to be out on the street and utilize their computers in their cars to type the reports that are necessary. An officer here does an average of about two reports a day that can be done uh, out in the street. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah, this uh, uh, Chief, first of all, thank you for that prompt response that you gave me. But uh, one of my questions is, prior to you becoming chief, there was this project called the Hail Mary Project. And I drove down Fifth Street and saw the big radio tower. And I'm just kind of wondering, what's the status of that? Is it on hiatus or is it still there? My understanding is, and I spoke to the officer that was a key part of that project, and uh, it seemed like a great idea. I, I know that I could not take on doing the Hail Mary project and some of the MPO-related duties right now, but um, it is not active and hasn't been active for a little bit, uh, but the, the crux of the project and the, uh, the goal you know, that they stand for was something that ser seriously aligns with what we're trying to do as an organization. So I think you'll see in the strategic plan and aim to get that restarted as one of our goals. Each uh, one of the command staff members will have, will be a goal champion and have uh, different goals and action items they're gonna be responsible for developing over the next five years. Thank you. Mr. Klein, you wanna add a thought? Yeah, um, I called uh, this work session. I feel that it's overdue to have a work session about the violence because I know we have a lot of wonderful things coming up this year in downtown while we're doing We've done so many things to attract people here, and of course we had that murder on 4th Street, and it just knocked everyone over. We know that violence seems to have been getting worse. I mean, I know in the calendar year you compared last year with the first five months of this year, and the statistics, everything there seemed to be hitting on par with last year. We've only got five months in, which startled me. Um, I wondered what we're, how we are handling it. I mean, uh, what are we going to do when we have? Oops. What are we going to do when we have um, Rag Rai coming and all of these big events to make sure people feel safe downtown? And then, if you don't mind, and I don't, didn't know whether it fit better in the last part of this or in this part, I do have some more personalized questions that I got phone calls on and I'd like to ask. Personalized questions. Well, I mean. Maybe I should just do those quick. Um, is it, I got a phone call. I get a lot of phone calls. Um, and, I, and you're the, the source that should be able to set us straight on this. Is it true that- Sure, because it may be rumor. Well, and, and if it is a rumor that someone heard and shared with me, then let's put it straight. Um, are the officers forbidden to wear a flag shirt? This is ridiculous. No. 
are they forbidden to wear the thin blue line thing? You have not forbidden them to wear it. Um, if you have an officer that would like to direct their questions to me, they could certainly do so. Um, I could answer that for them. They could read into the policy some and understand that those are things that we've allowed. We all receive phone calls, all of us, from general citizenry all over the place. So I'm just relaying what general citizens uh, ask I, uh, me about. I and you know, they, how do they, they, you know, short of them calling in, and a lot of them are shy about making those kinds of phone calls. I appreciate it. I'd encourage you to, much like Mr. Amos and other council people, uh, to give me a call directly. I would right. certainly love to answer them in a forum that doesn't require us to have a personal live session. I'm certainly available. I'm always able to answer your questions, and I would love to put these things to rest as soon yeah. as you hear them. That'd well, be great. well let's, let's, yeah. let's do it now. Um, is it true that the officers all have to be qualified on a firearm to serve, that that's policy that they have to be qualified? Oh, yes, yes. Is it true that the chief has to be qualified? That is true. Is it true that you are not qualified? Not at this time. I am given a qualification extension of over six more months to be qualified. That's an interesting question because, you know, I've been a police officer for 30 years, mm -hmm. uh, qualified in every state. And unfortunately, in this state, I have had a sh shoulder surgeries that have stopped me from being able to do the physical qualification. Uh, but I would tell you that I've never not qualified in any state that I've worked in. Uh, so you can put the, Six months. I think you, what you could do is put the folks at ease and tell them that, that that'll happen. Uh, you know, have, I haven't had a problem getting qualified in Pennsylvania or Texas, so I don't see this as being a problem either. Great. Um, are the officers required to always wear body cams and body armor? Officers are. And Patrol officers, those who are typically on the street, the majority of their uh, I should say the majority of their tour of duty and are assigned to administrative functions are responsible for that. And and you as a chief, if you go to a crime scene, are you required to wear body armor and body armor? Uh, body I'm not. And uh, because I may go to a crime scene as if I'm going to, let's say, a community meeting, uh, I certainly would, you know, be en route to a community meeting and stop at a crime scene first. So fortunately, as the chief, I've been able to stop a few people that were wanted for shootings and other things that are really important. So, uh, you know, in doing so, I, you know, don't necessarily always have a active body cam available, nor should any of the people assigned to command staff. That's for the police officers. That's why I advocated for the new body worn cameras that you guys approved. I'm sorry, that everyone else on council approved. And that, uh, you know, I want to ensure that everybody from top to bottom has access to the same type of equipment. So I'd rather my officers have access to, to that equipment than me taking it or go taking it from another person within the department. Okay, and along that line of questioning, I just have one more. Do we do exit interviews with officers that have decided to leave? Uh, if the officers care to. It isn't a policy that we do. It's not a policy. Um, so you're not particularly aware of their feelings about the department? I didn't say that. Know. You said that. Yes. That wasn't a question. Well, I'm, I meant it as a question. I am very aware of some of the people that have left the police department who were unwilling to conform with some of the changes that have been made, like uh, some of the policy changes that were ordered through council that we needed to change. Uh, some were very dissatisfied with that. And with that dissatisfaction, you get attrition. When a new police chief takes over in a new city, you're not going to have everyone that likes the fact that we have to change. I have a uh, statement that I live by. It was, I was the much better police chief when I was a police officer. So that accounts for every one of us from top to bottom in the police agency that thinks, absent all the rest of the information, that they would do something different. Again, I'm working to, to balance this level of service that we give the people in the community. I'm working to make sure the officers get the support and the equipment and everything that they need to do their jobs. And I think we've made tremendous strides. So if by some chance those who have left the agency are unhappy, well, I mean, I, I know and I'm aware that some are unhappy, but I also know that the majority of people who I speak with are very happy with the things that are happening here. 
So I take that with a grain of salt. So getting back to the, um, the violence, which the violent causes, um, with, that, with it being said that we have, first of all, the loss of life is absolutely tragic. Second of all, two of the, the homicides that I got to actually the most calls on were the, the shooting in the after hours bar and then the Phoenix police shooting. What are, we doing, what are we doing to make sure that people feel protected coming in? Coming in? Coming in to join us at my Wallalu Day's parade at Juneteenth at Irish Fest at Brag Bright. <coughs> we're having a lot clustered downtown. No, we're not. That's well, an inaccurate statement. And mm -hmm. I, I would think that you wouldn't want to perpetuate uh, a thought mm -hmm. that our downtown area is plagued by violence, which it is not. And do we have plans in place to have an extra police presence See, so during those things? We actually things? have a good, you know, one of the things that I instituted when I got here was mandatory operational planning. Uh, people weren't happy about that, but that is one of the things that I have changed in this department that we do. So we have operational plans that we use for each and every event. We also have cost analysis that we do for each and every event, something else that wasn't, been, that wasn't being done. Uh, during the planning process. So our planning P uh, gets done with a great deal of, of input and a great deal of forethought uh, about this community and to ensure that we are providing the right and appropriate amount of protection for these events. So um, you'll find that we brought in other city departments to talk about these events. We brought in fire, we brought in public works, we had meetings and talked and discussed. Uh, who would have what role? And those roles are written down those roles are done so in an incident command model that uh, we should be expected to be presented in. And, you know, we do things that way for a reason. And they're not generally shared with anyone outside of police or fire or those that are involved. But we do it nonetheless. I appreciate your answers, and I turn it over to anyone else with questions. And um, I believe on June 21st, I'm already, um, what's this, task force? Task force will be after our establishments. Yeah. We still want to present that. So the 21st, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Marty is going to have his task force uh, information uh, to address violence at after hours establishments. And also, if I'm not mistaken, on June 10th, um, we have a meeting with the downtown business owners to talk about plans, holistic plans that we have for. Uh, making sure that people feel comfortable and safe uh, in the downtown area. So thank the chief for working to put that strategy together along with his, uh, with his staff as well. No, thank Mr. you and downtown, the downtown Waterloo folks. We needed the, that bridge and I wanted to be able to explain what it was we were doing down there and you guys made it possible. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bozen. Just a quick question, Chief. We talked about this when we had our this up and it had to do with the automated traffic enforcement. Yes, sir. Uh, under Chief Trelka, we entered into a contract with Gatsco for six tablets so that our officers could write municipal infractions from the calls. Did that fall by the wayside? Do we know what happened to that program? Did we get the tablets? Have we moved forward with it? I had no knowledge of that. But I, 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 we talked briefly about it at that, at yeah, that fireworks I, meeting. I do not know that the tablets are have been issued or up and running. Joe, would you be able to shed any light so on that? Did it just fall by the wayside? Or is this something we got my eye pursue in the future? I know it was talked about, but it never moved past that stage. Oh, okay, because we did, we did it. The council did authorize a contract for that. It's, 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 it wouldn't be a revenue generation. I don't know if get involved in that. Okay, thanks. Well, you know, I've been an advocate of having those in the cars to save time. Uh, police, all the police officer has to do is swipe the driver's license through and, you know, there's a printer inside the car usually there to gen help generate the tickets and such. So I'll definitely uh, open that back up and uh, forgive me if I, you know, said that I would look into it and I didn't, but I certainly will. Mr. Mr. Ryder. Excuse me, Chief. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the body cameras. We Most of us approve the body cameras. Um, I've, I personally firmly believe that having a body camera keeps police officers safe, keeps our Citizen safe keeps us transparent, keeps us functioning as a city. Can you just update us on where we are at in that process? 
I just got the, uh, the training <laughs> update today. Okay. Do you recall how, when the first data training is, Joe, or could you, could you bring that email up? Uh, what we're doing is we have to incrementally train uh, everyone in the department on yeah. how to operate the, uh, sorry, how to operate the body camera, how to operate the in-car system, hmm. how to um, engage not only the, the body cam functionality, but retrieve the information from the body cams. Um, the difference in like the taser equipment as well. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, a couple aggressively scheduled training modules for, for officers. If you can give me the dates, Joe, if you, if you got it. <coughs> And then my, my second question, um, so you hear a lot about budgets, uh, and budgets are really what makes things go. Yes, sir. Um, so, and I know this is, you're just wrapping up your first year now, but generally what has happened over the last five years, if you have that data or 10 years, what has happened to the police budget? Are, are we in line with, with our sister cities? Are we above? Are we below? If we're looking at those 67,000 plus resident cities, is our department being funded? at levels that are comparable to other cities to deal with what we're dealing with. I, I'd love to give you that okay. answer. I, I don't want to misspeak sure. and then say, uh, I, I, I will, in my personal opinion, as in one year, I would love to see more dedicated to the training uh, environment because I believe for retention, retention purposes, uh, an investment in training for officers helps us retain people and helps us attract people. We have a, a pretty, minimal training budget and I think that might be the one area that in one year's time I would tell you that I would change but if you'd like me to, to look at the other areas and give you an answer yeah, should you say other cities for a comp I'll do that if you could and yes, also always thank you for being available you know I've had people email me call me with rumors and other things and thank you for being open to set the record straight on a one-to-one -one level yes sir thank you I appreciate you giving it right to me you know, I, I can't change things if I don't hear them. Please. Yeah, just one final comment, if I may. Um, on a nationwide basis, we're hearing more and more about violence, and um, there's just been some terrible mass shootings. I commend all of the police officers for doing such a good job of taking care of crime in our city. It's not as bad as some people are making it. Um, appear to be, I think you're doing an incredible job, especially in light of what is going on on a national basis. So thank you. Since you've been here, you've implemented a lot of good things and we're very appreciative. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you for feedback. All right. And uh, Chief, thank you for the, um, the uh, uh, reports. Thank you for the uh, PowerPoint. Uh, thank you for answering uh, questions. Uh, or rumors, uh, standing up to the mic and uh, ask, answering those questions. So uh, we respect you and we thank you for your service, sir. And uh, we appreciate all the work that's being done in the department. So well, thank, thank you. you. I have some five year stuff. If you don't mind, I'll step out, make some copies and just give them to everybody in council and Kelly, you know, in case you want to publish it. But it just gives you five years of perspective. on. The so I think we, we've been hearing it's been, I guess, who had who came up with five years? Oh, I did. Okay. <laughs> like, I'm wondering where that number came. Because that's Pulled ironically the number of the year. yeah. years I've been in office. <laughs> but what is, um, what is just really quickly before Mr. Treeler, um, what, um, what, is it up or down or is it stagnant or? Well, we're down. I, you know, from 20, 2015, if we start from 2015 to 2016, you're looking at down 2.71%. 2016 to 2017, down 3.52 uh percent you know and then slightly down in the next year 1.7 percent down a little further 4.03 percent then 7.04 percent so you know these are you know in major you know major crime areas um we are again these officers you know yeah, we, we were fond of saying that we're grumpy and that we complain a lot and everything else but they are doing a fantastic job Despite any uh, rumor or innuendo, yeah. the guys go out there and do a hell of a job uh, with what they have. And that's been consistent over the last couple of years. Again, I'm very proud to be a part of this department and proud of them and proud of my command staff for doing what they've done over the last few years. But, 
you should all know and see this. Um, yeah. And our and I think, suits are down as well. And, right? and I got open. Yes, they are. And I have to apologize because when I gave Kelly this information, I did not incorporate that five-year crime stat in it, I don't believe. So I'll make sure you get it. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. And uh, thank you so much, sir. You're welcome. And as thank we transition to Mr. Trelor, as we transition to Mr. Trelor, <laughs> let me thank <laughs> Kelly for swapping. Yeah. I appreciate he had to that. Rock. Well. He had to rock a little bit to get off. <laughs> but I, I think uh, the budget, budget increase uh, police wise, 23% in five years. I think the budget has increased by about 20, 23%, but you just need to make sure it's increasing in the right places. Yeah. So, and? Right. Okay, very good. Good evening, Council. Are we ready to go, Mr. Mayor? Hey, yes, sir. Whenever All right. you are. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm ready. So, uh, Pat Treeler, Fire Chief, I'm excited to give you an update uh, on the department, where we're at, uh, where I, th I think we're going, and just give you kind of a quick uh, SWOT analysis, if you will, of our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. It'll be just kind of a quick presentation, on it, but I think you'll, you'll get a good idea where we're at. So first of all, uh, we're 113 total members of the department. Uh, 100 of us are sworn of that, uh, excuse me, 110 of us are sworn of that uh, 110 sworn, 105 uh, work on shift. So we operate three shifts, A, B, and C shift. Uh, so our goal with having the SAFER grant where you approved four individuals we hired on under a federal grant, uh, our goal is to have 35 uh, per shift. We have currently, we have three open positions. Uh, we've had a couple of uh, surprise retirements with another one coming uh, by the end of June, we expect. So we'll have four open positions. And then um, sadly, we have four long-term injuries right now. So you could view us as uh, being eight uh, personnel down. Of our sworn personnel, I broke it down there on the, on the slide for you. I'm not gonna go through it all, but um, we have one chief, and I say that kind of with a smile. Uh, we don't have an assistant chief here in Waterloo, and we haven't had, <coughs> excuse me, we haven't had for uh, probably 20 plus years. We're very light on administrative staffing compared to other departments our size. You can see we have three battalion chiefs, uh, one chief per, per uh, shift, and they operate on shift. They're a 24-hour employee, and those are the, the three other non-bargaining uh, personnel uh, that are sworn is myself and the three battalion chiefs. The rest are in the, the, in the local Union 66. We do have three administrative staff, um, civilian staff, and then you can see the breakdown uh, with the rest of the shifts. Oftentimes cities uh, talk about how many firefighters they have per thousand residents. In Waterloo, we're right about 1.6 firefighters per 1,000 residents. If you were to poll the state, we're somewhere in the middle. So we're not, you know, we're not high staffed, we're not low staffed, we're somewhere in the middle with that number, the 1.6. So I just thought I'd give you a quick overview of how we're doing call wise. Uh, in 2019, <clears throat> we had 11,168 911 calls, or what we call calls for service. In 2020, which is the number up on the slide, before you're there, it, uh, you can see it's 11,341, so it's a slight increase. Those are 911 calls. Sometimes a 911 call generates one uh, unit response, and in other calls, it may be eight or nine units. So of that 11,341, you can see that it was a total response of 14,751 units uh, to take care of the uh, of the emergencies within the community. One particular note on there, our average travel time of four minutes and 22 seconds, you see it listed there. That is the time it takes when we receive the dispatch information, so it comes over the tones at the stations. 
on average were on scene in four minutes and 22 seconds, which is outstanding. There's some large metro areas around the country that are three or four times um, that response time. So, so we're very proud. We're very proud of that. On the EMS side, um, I just kind of thought I'd break it down a little bit for you. All of our sworn personnel are required to be emergency medical technicians or EMTs, but we have a higher level of uh, an EMT, and it's called a paramedic. And you can see there we've listed we have 49 paramedics right now. I'd like to see that number somewhere in the 60s. The training has gotten a lot longer over the years. It's more difficult to get uh, personnel into the uh, classes at Hawkeye because there's prerequisites that are involved. And there's a national and local shortage of paramedics. But we're still pleased we have 49 of our 110 sworn are, are medics. A few years ago, we implemented a medical supervisor type of quick response vehicle. We worked with Public Works on it. It was a, a suburban and uh, we've seen a lot of good results with that. Our medical supervisor is assigned to that vehicle. It has all the equipment uh, except for a cot. We cannot transport to the hospital. But that individual, uh, Jason Hernandez is our medical supervisor, provides field supervision of our medics. But more importantly, he'll go on uh, a lot of our serious calls as well as releasing an ambulance uh, from a scene. For example, if there's a death, Oftentimes, we need to wait for the medical examiner to come. That'll hold up an ambulance, sometimes, depending on how busy the medical examiner is, well over an hour. So then the medical supervisor will go out with his vehicle, release the ambulance, which is appropriate, and wait for the uh, medical examiner. So that's been working well for us. We have one of the busiest ambulances in the state. We're not necessarily proud of it, but our ambulance that runs out of our downtown station you can see on the slide there, uh, they transported 2,530 uh, patients in 2020. So that's a large percentage of our transports. We're still trying to figure out an appropriate way to share that workload while still offering uh, great response times. So we know where our business is, where our frequently called to areas, and it's in the downtown area. It somewhat follows the river. All right, so revenue overview, you can see there, if you had a chance to take a look at this, um, in 2020, we had a significant increase in revenue. And then in this current fiscal year that's just ending, we're projecting being somewhere right about $4.6 million. So you can see in 17 and 18, we we're approximately at 1.8 million. In 19, we had a little dip to 1.7. And then in 2020, we're at uh, 3.3 million. So, and that's predominantly due to the ground emergency medical transport that you've probably heard me speak of plenty of times. And I've got another slide on it and go in a little bit more detail. But so for this current fiscal year, we amended our budget, worked with CFO Wiener and the mayor. We amended it uh, about 1.2 million to get it to the 3.2 million. And so obviously, we're still going to be 1.3 million over the amended amount because, like I said, we're projecting 4.6 million revenue at the end of this fiscal year. It's hard not to smile when I say it, but it's really good news. So there are costs involved with the ground emergency medical uh, transport, the GMT. There's certainly uh, costs involved, and I'll discuss it right now on the next uh, next slide. So the program is a federal initiative designed help services like Waterloo Fire that serve Medicaid patients. So what the, what the federal government basically has said, prove to us what your cost per run is, and we'll make it right when you transport a Medicaid patient. So on the slide there, you can see the average payment before the GMT was $125 for a transport. Now, on top of that $125, the federal government provides $831 on top of that $125. Out of that, we've listed some expenses that we have there. And you can see we have a Digitech payment of $2,705. So we use a 
a billing company that does a phenomenal job for us out of New York. They take a percentage of net revenue. And on the GMT portion, they take 2.5%. So you can see we pay on every Medicaid call, we pay $27 to our billing company. And then there's a thing called the state share. So the federal government and the state, Iowa State Enterprise, Medicaid Enterprise, got together and say, hey, look, this is a partnership. So we'll give, you this, we'll give you this money to your providers, but then you need to pay back the state share. Very confusing. Um, if Michelle's still in the room, she can nod her head that it's she confusing. She is. <laughs> okay. That's good. I wasn't going to turn around. And then uh, we also have a cost of, uh, we've hired a consultant because there's an enormous amount of work that goes along with this. There's audits. We're under audit right now from uh, state Medicaid. And uh, our, our consultant um, gets 11% of revenue under this program. So there are, there are expenses uh, uh, involved. So why is our, our revenue so high this year? And I'm not going to try to confuse anybody, but basically we've got a million dollars of revenue in this year's budget that technically should have been paid in last year's budget from the feds. So if you look at our projection for next year, we're project, projecting revenue at 3.6 million. We're gonna, we're gonna end at 4.6 million this year, and that's because there's a million dollars in there from the previous year. So if you see that we're, gonna, we're projecting a million dollars less next year, that's why. So our budget for 22 is set at 3.6 million. Okay, so I wanted to talk about some strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and talk about strengths to start off with. We feel we have the, we have public trust, and we certainly have the support of the community, and we're very respectful of that. Another strength we have is obviously our members' dedication, their commitment, their training, their knowledge. I see it day in and day out. It's, we've got a phenomenal group. ISO rating, if you remember that, that's an insurance service organization. It's a privately held or privately funded company that tells insurance companies what a rating of a fire department is, their effectiveness at protecting infrastructure within the community. <laughs> One being the best, 10 being kind of really hard to get insurance, we're at a two. So that's very good for our corporate um, citizens. If you own an average house and we say went to an ISO rated four, ISO rating five for some reason, your rates probably aren't going to be affected much. But our corporate uh, citizens or corporate businesses would see an increase. We operate fire-based EMS. I mean, I th we thought it was a great thing before the GMT came along. I think it's even a better system. We have cross-trained. We have paramedics on fire trucks today that can help paramedics that are on the ambulance. They can hop in, add a three-man crew. Uh, we're blessed to have fire-based EMS. Our response times, I mentioned, are very good compared to others in the state and very, very good compared to the rest of the country. And obviously, uh, we feel the EMS revenue is a real strength. So some weaknesses. We've got to talk about those. Aging fleet. I think we do a very good job. Randy and his crew does a good job uh, keeping our equipment on the road, but we do have a lot of old equipment. And we got a, we got a lot of old members, <laughs> so we're uh, we're getting a little bit older. There's a number of us that are uh, very close to retirement, so we think that's a weakness of the organization. Succession plan to go along with all those aging members, we got to do a better job of that. Our department is lacking diversity. We'd like to see it increased. We've made some. Uh, Strides in doing that. Recently, we've hired uh, two women. We have two more women on our list. Uh, we anticipate uh, being able to hire uh, coming up sometime in the near future after uh, hiring delays uh, over. But um, so we think we're we're making some progress on the lack of diversity. Station closures. We're still rounding out station six. That's a definite weakness. Uh, organizationally, we need to make some sort of shift to be able to accept change. Uh, better within the, the culture of the fire department. I'm willing to take suggestions on how to get that done. Uh, Good luck. I, I've taken a few classes on it. We're working on it with our command staff. We're making some progress, but that's definitely a weakness. Yeah. 
And administrative training was very, very hard for us to find the previous year you know, through the pandemic. So that, that's a weakness. We need, to do, we need to give our administrative staff, our, our battalion chiefs, our admins, uh, we need to give them uh, better training. Okay, some opportunities that uh, we're working on. One of our organiz organizational goals was to train and work closer with uh, Waterloo PD. We conducted a tabletop exercise recently at our training center. We had probably, f probably seven command staff from uh, Waterloo PD and probably eight of us at fire. So we went through an active shooter type of situation and then we've agreed upon we're going to do a, a full scale exercise in August. So we're pretty excited about that. We work well with Waterloo PD. They work well with us. We just don't often train uh, together that often. Officer development, uh, that's a huge opportunity for us. We're working on a program. We've got a battalion chief coming up with a program there so we develop our officers properly. An opportunity, it's a huge one, is to become an accredited fire department. It's a massive job. It's basically a full-time position for a year. I've talked to many departments that have gone through it. Uh, I can't do it on my own, so we're, st we're still trying to look at an avenue of how to become accredited. And I'd like to see more of our members uh, attend the National Fire Academy. It's, f it's free to our members. The feds pay for their travel, pay for their meal ticket, pay for their uh, <coughs> lodging there. I've been five or six times. I know uh, Councilman Bozen's been out a number of times. So that's an opportunity. <coughs> and then some of our threats, I'll just go through them quick. I don't know where I'm at on timing, but uh, I think you could probably hear this as threats from any department, but uh, reduced funding could be a threat, reduced staffing. Uh, hazards of the job with going through the pandemic, uh, we seem to have a lot more mental illness in our community. We just had a very violent patient today that we had some exposures on. So the hazards of the jobs are obviously threats. We're seeing a little bit like Waterloo PD, the hiring pool is being, um, so the talent pool is a little bit smaller. Competition for these jobs is, is very high. Uh, member mental health, uh, we're concerned with all of our members' me uh, mental health, but the last year the pandemic sure showed that we're vulnerable to that. Uh, and I just throw in there overuse of electronic communications. I know you're probably all uh, were sick of Zoom. I certainly was. We had a number of meetings throughout the year that, that weren't in person. We had a staff meeting uh, this morning, all in person. So uh, I was pleased with that. So we're going to try to reduce a lot of our communications through electronic uh, means. But that's all I had for you. And. Uh, I'd yeah. certainly be open to any questions you may have. Mr. Bozen. Okay, quick uh, question, Chief. On the 1.6 firefighters per 1,000, and the average range with other cities in the state, we're fire-based EMS. So <coughs> we have X amount of paramedics that are assigned in the ambulance, and that, that function as firefighters, not many of these other cities we're comparing them to uh, at the 1.6 have fire-based EMS, or are they, are they all firefighters? Yeah, not all of them. No, they don't all have EMS. So like, for example, today we have uh, station six is open. So we have 27 on shift today. Six of those 27 are assigned to the ambulance where some other departments may not have that. So we, we actually are doing more or less 1.6 firefighters. A lot of those are, are, are really functioning. Correct. It, and for a true comparison, you would back out the six per shift that Waterloo has, say, up against Iowa City that doesn't run. Um, Fire-based EMS. And the last thing is, is your administration's flat. Everyone goes to fires, you know, and, and <coughs> yeah, the chief, if, if, you, if you can find it in our budget to uh, support administrative assistant chief, then you can, that would really help your department out. Yeah, I, th I think the, the first thing we'd do is put that, uh, if we had an assistant <coughs> chief, would be in charge of operations. Uh, a lot of my days spent uh, administratively with uh, personnel issues, uh, budget-related issues. Uh, my admin is leaving the end of June, um, so I'm just going to be swamped with some of the admin stuff. But it's been a goal. I just haven't been willing to take the hit on shift uh, to pull someone off the line or lose a position on line uh, so I'd have an assistant. Excuse me. Thank you. Ms. Julian. Yeah, just a quick question on the accreditation. 
sounds like a lot of work. What, what are the benefits of doing that? Well, the, the benefits are it, it forces you to look at where you're lacking within the organization. So whether it be through standard operating guidelines, your rules and regs, your training format, the list goes on and on and on. You know, How I, often I, do you have to do that, go through that accreditation? Every five years. Um, but the first accreditation process is very, very long. It's difficult. I've looked at it. I've taken some training on it. Um, that would be that would be another uh, avenue if we did happen to get an administrative chief or assistant chief at some point. That would be uh, a, a goal to become uh, accredited. Thank you. Mrs. Klein. I just want to tell you that was a great report. I just felt it was very straightforward. I, you talked about your achievements. This is this is from the top down. I just think you're doing a great job, and I hope you, you will take back my best wishes to everyone works in the fire okay. business. Very from, good. from the firemen to the medical people to the secretary or whatever, I think they all deserve a pat on the back. Well, thank you. I will for sure. Just appreciate that. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, Chief, uh, just a, maybe just a couple of questions. Um, as we're getting close to the end of the fiscal year, what's, the, what's been the open status of Station 6 for this, this year? I wouldn't have that number right off the top of my head. I can okay. certainly get it for you, Mr. Okay. Boyce. Okay. Um, I would say it'd be very similar to the previous year, um, but I can get you that number, and I can email it to all council if, if you'd like that. And, and then in regards to that, what, what's the status of the overtime situation? I know you know we we're talking about reducing the, the for next year um, the the overtime budget. Do you anticipate? I, I mean, I'm hopeful with getting four. Well, you have to find four firefighters, you know, and, and have them. But what, where are we at in terms of how much we spent in overtime this year? Do you have any idea? Sure. Well, I, this current year we're um, budgeted 178,000, if I remember correct. We're somewhere down below. We probably have somewhere around 10,000 left. Next fiscal year's beginning July one, our overtime budget was reduced 78,000 to 100,000. So June, July, and August, we're anticipating Station 6 being closed a fair bit. The policy moving forward, beginning July 1, I just told staff this morning, is that we'll hire one firefighter back on overtime to keep the station open. We're not going to hire two, three, four. Some days last summer, we were hiring five or six uh, uh, personnel back. We'll just we'll just blow through that 100,000 before the end of September. So. Uh, you know, it's not a it's not a positive thing, but Station Six will be browned out. Yep. Yeah, just curious. Thank you, Mr. Welcome, Mr. Uh, Grider. So, Chief, as a son of a firefighter, I want to thank you and all of your staff for what they do. I know what that is and what that means for your people, especially mental health wise. And I can only imagine what this last year was. Um, can you just give us an update on the Safer Grant and where we're at in that process? Because, like Councilman Voice, I share concerns about Station Six being browned out. I get obviously the cost and that kind of stuff, but I was we talked about the SAFER grant as a way to mitigate that. So where are we at in that process? Well, so the four are currently on. Okay. They're hired. Uh, we've done uh, one of our first downloads from the federal government. So we've, we've been paid what we've asked for. We've notified them of the hiring delay that was put in our budget uh, twice. I did not hear back on that. Um, but so to answer your question, the four are hired. But sadly, the, we're going to be we're going to be four short uh, with four openings. I'm anticipating being able to fill those four openings at the end of September. I think that'll be the time frame to get rid of the not get rid of use up the uh, hiring delay that's been put in our budget. So we're anticipating uh, October first we would bring on the four members that we're going to be short. And one of the concerns when we talked about the safer grant was. What happens when the grant runs out and how do we pay for them? But you talked about the attrition of, of a slightly aging department. Do you still think that it's very likely we'll be able to transition these people into positions through attrition at this current juncture? Well, if I understand what you're saying, I mean, it, I would hope that the council would keep us at our authorized level. So whether there was positions to go to or not, I would hope that we would be kept at 110 sworn. But 
with that said, uh, we're going to have number a number of openings over the next two to three years that if council was not able to keep us at 110, if we went to 106, I think we'd be able to take them back into the department and uh, we would have openings. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Well, Chief, uh, we're coming to the conclusion. And just like, uh, you know, our conversation with uh, uh, Chief Fitzgerald, I want to thank you and your department's uh, leadership. Um, people probably don't know the significant role uh, that all of you played to help us uh, uh, through COVID. So you and Hernandez, your entire staff, and just like PD, kind of put yourselves on the line by having direct interaction mm -hmm. Uh, with people and I know there's a lot of cases that had gone through so uh, we want to thank you so much for the uh, pursuit of excellence with all of your department as well so thank yeah. you great thank you yeah. good job Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Chief. motion to adjourn second. Second. We made with second all in favor aye, aye. we're adjourned